got six scripture verses we're going to read uh, this morning. And I'm going to read the first one. And I've asked five other people if they would read theirs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say your name and the passage I've asked you to read and just stand up where you are and just read it in a nice loud voice from where you are. Sounds good? We could pull this off, I think, <laughs> rather than having a steady march of people to the microphone. So the first one we're going to read is from Jeremiah. I had Jeremiah on my phone. I just lost it. That's why paper is better. I don't know why I use the phone. This paper is so much better. But let's put my phone the Bible up here. So let's do this. Jeremiah chapter 4, starting at verse 11 and 12. At that time, this people told, uh, this people, try again. At that time, the people and Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows towards my people, but not a winnow, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong that comes from me. Now I pronounce my judgments against them. This is the Lord speaking and jumping down to, page, to verse 22. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking at all the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will, moan, will mourn and the heavens above grow dark. Because I have spoken and will not relent, I have decided and will not turn back. Helen. Uh, Psalm 14, 1 to 7. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside, and they are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who may eat up my people as they eat up bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were to come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Thanks. Rick, Exodus 32, verses 7 to 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them, and have made themselves an idol, cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it, and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. O Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented, and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Thanks. Rob, Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. 
Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Thanks. Julie, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. One who was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And Gina, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. Thank you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is personal and that as each person has read it uh, in the congregation, um, it's, a, it's just a symbol of how your word uh, is very real and, and wants to intersect with our lives and wants to speak to our, our lives in very practical ways. And I pray, Father, that as we look at these passages and what they said in ancient times and what they say to us today, that um, you'd make them real and practical to our hearts and lives and that you would just guide us as we consider what it is you'd have to say to us. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So a number of churches use what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, and they assign scripture verses to be read on certain Sundays. And these six verses were assigned to one particular Sunday to be read together. And uh, sometimes the, verses, the passages in the lectionary 
you look at them and it's like they don't really have a whole lot to do with, with each other, but these seem to have a thread. And there are two things that strike me as I think of these six passages that we've looked at, that we've read today. One is how much these ancient passages can be used to describe the condition of the world today. And secondly, I notice a definite progression of theme from the first passage that I read to the last one that Gina read. And we'll look at that this morning. So the first three passages we read describe a world where people have turned from God. And they're intent on living lives their own way, and they end up reaping the consequences of these decisions. And there are some aspects of the lives of the people that are in common with these three passages, and they can be seen in many ways in today's world as well. People are described in Jeremiah as being fools or foolish or senseless. In Jeremiah, this, this foolishness is linked to not knowing God. So many people today don't understand that God is a person, someone who can be known, not just someone far off. You know, maybe they've, they've experienced a religion growing up where that made God seem distant and unknowable. Maybe they just haven't given God the space in their lives. There's just too much going on in their lives and there's no room to consider God. They haven't even given themselves a chance to know him. Maybe we as a church haven't shown them by how we live our own lives, that there is a God who can be known. Without the guidance of the God of the universe in our lives, we're left to our own decisions, to our own devices. We are left to make huge life decisions based on what very little information our finite minds can, can contain. And we end up making life-altering decisions that are based on, on short-term positive results totally ignoring the, the long-term negative consequences of our decisions. And in that way, we become fools. We make foolish decisions and, and we arrive at foolish conclusions. Psalm 14 that Helen read first describes one conclusion the foolish come to. They say in their hearts, there is no God. We've seen over the last 10, 15 years or so, the, the rise in the West of what's been called the new atheism. And the proponents of this school of thought are, are more strident, they're more in your face, they're more confrontational than their predecessors. And their methodology doesn't just stop at trying to convince others of their point of view, but they make efforts to ridicule and belittle people who don't share their worldview. They'll, they'll, they'll call people of faith mentally ill and say they worship the great spaghetti monster in the sky. I've always maintained that atheism, the statement that there is categorically no God, is not an intellectually honest position. It's like saying there's no gold in China. I, I, I didn't think this analogy up, I read it somewhere and it just made a lot of sense to me. You can make the categorical statement, there is no gold in China. And you could base that statement on years of research and travel throughout China searching for gold. But in making that statement, you are assuming that there is no gold somewhere in Upper Mongolia in some mountain range, untouched by your research, untouched even by anybody else's research, untouched by humanity. You cannot say there is no gold in China unless you've examined every inch of Chinese soil and determined without a doubt that there is no gold. Likewise, the statement that there is no God can only be verified and ascertained if one has examined every inch of the universe and found no evidence of God. To say there is no God makes an impossible assumption that, that the person making the statement has unlimited knowledge. To say that there's no God is actually a faith statement as much as it is as saying there is a God is a faith statement. Atheism, the statement that there is no God, is not a plausible con conclusion that a finite human can come to. It is arrogant, it's foolish. I heard an atheist speak a few years ago when I was taking courses at, at Sindale. Our teacher had us, brought in some interesting speakers into the class, and so he brought this speaker in who used to be a Christian minister and had become an atheist. And he wanted us to hear this fellow's point of view. And he was confronted with this logic that I just laid out before you, and, and he backed down a bit, and he, he said, well, according to the evidence that I have seen, as far as I know, there is no God. And as soon as he crossed into that line of logic, he's, he's no longer an atheist. He's now an agnostic. 
which I think is a much more intellectually honest position, something that we can deal with. Agnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. And the A in front of it is the negative. Atheism comes from the Greek word theos, meaning God. So atheism means a theos, no God. Agnostic means agnosis, I don't know, there's no knowledge. I don't know if there's a God. Which to me means the person is at least willing to be convinced if they are presented with suitable proof and suitable evidence. So whenever, it doesn't happen often, but when I engage in this conversation with someone who describes himself as an atheist, my first line of discussion is to try to help them understand what you're really saying when you describe yourself as an atheist. You're saying you've, you've examined the, and you've, you've researched the entire of the universe and you can categorically state there's no God. And when confronted with that, people kind of go, well, well, no, I haven't, I can't categorically say that. And so we want to help them move them to a position of agnosticism, at least, you know, okay, so at least what you're saying is you don't know that there's a God. Yeah, okay, we can live with that. Okay, now let's talk about it because I believe that there's a God who can be known. Let's talk about it. The second aspect I see in common in these passages is a lack of understanding. Jeremiah talks about the people having no understanding. Psalm 14 talks about people who lack wisdom and do not seek God. Our lives, our souls, our spirits were created to be in connection with God, in connection with the Holy Spirit. The philosopher Blaise Pascal famously said that there is a God-shaped void in every human. Without the presence of the Spirit, without a welcoming attitude towards the guidance of God in our lives, we are left to our own finite capacity to be able to understand what's going on around us. George Washington Carver was a famous African-American scientist and inventor in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he's credited with discovering many uses for the peanut as food. Prior to him, people didn't quite know what to do with the peanut. And he discovered all kinds of uses for it and transformed agricultural development in the southern U.S. And when he when was asked about his discoveries and his, his scientific method and how he went about doing things, he's quoted as saying that he simply prayed and asked for guidance and then followed whatever the Holy Spirit told him to do. Truth is a gift from God. Spiritual truth must be spiritually discerned. Without spiritual understanding, people leave themselves open to all sorts of lies, even lies that can be scientifically disproven they still end up believing them. And they end up believing that there are many different genders in the world, even though science and biology and Genesis both agree there are only two. They end up believing that abortion only removes cells from a woman's body, even though science and ultrasound technology and Psalm 139 tell us that there is life in the smallest fetus. Foolishness and lack of understanding leads to actions that, that would be consistent with their thoughts. And Jeremiah terms it, says it, he says that they are skilled at doing evil. It's become such a problem in life that, that practice is made perfect when it comes to carrying out evil deeds when doing wrong. Psalm 14 says that they have done abominable deeds. Exodus, tells, Exodus, the passage in Exodus we read, says that the people had acted perversely. See, life without God is a slippery slope. We start out, think, you know, we start out with what we think is harmless ways of thinking. And they become what we feel are harmless ways of acting and doing things. But as the action becomes a habit, becomes a way of life, the actions become more and more perverse. They slip further and further down the hill. And we find ourselves very far from where we originally wanted to be, very far from where, where we, what we were created to be. I spent how many, 17 years working full-time with teenagers, and even now I still enjoy working with young people. And statistics tell us that when a teenager loses their virginity, about two-thirds of girls and 40% of boys say they regret it. And I've heard that regret in young voices that I've spoken to over the years. Yet I've also seen that once young people start heading down that path, for many it makes it easier and easier and easier to give in again when the opportunity arises. And that feeling of regret that was so strong at the beginning gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as their consciences grow harder and quieter. 
I've seen it the same thing when the first time a teenager gets drunk. I'll always remember downstairs in the basement, one young man came to me with this, this look of, of just sorrow on his face. And, and he said, he talked, told the story of how he was at a, a field party and, and got ridiculously drunk for the first time. And his own words were, I feel so ashamed. Yet sadly, as I watched this young man develop over the years and years, becoming crazy drunk just didn't bother him anymore. It just became easier to do. And sadly, as, as their inhibitions are lowered by alcohol, they find themselves making decisions and doing things that, that are irreversible and could change their lives forever. They become skilled at doing wrong and they end up reaping the consequences while those who love them, including God the Father, just stand back and watch absolutely brokenhearted. So the people in Jeremiah passage have come to the point where they don't even know how to do good anymore. People have become so lost in our society that the line between right and wrong, between good and evil, is barely recognizable to them anymore. And morality becomes a construct of one's context, becomes something generated by the will of the majority or the will of those in power, instead of something that is inherently placed in the human heart and inherently placed in the human soul by the Creator. And with our eyes tuned to the Holy Spirit, we can pretty easily tell, pretty easily tell what is right and what is wrong. Though being human, there are still times, you know, where we'll brush off that feeling, you know, that something's wrong if it's something we really want to do. But when the voice of the Spirit is continually ignored, it becomes imperceptible. And right and wrong becomes something that is, becomes subjective and it's judged by our own desires, judged in a utilitarian way. Does this work out the best for me? Does this give me the best results in the short term? Well, then it must be right. So divorce makes sense in that it will lessen the tension between two people and make them happier and able to pursue their wishes and their desires. But all that while they can't see that their children are left to deal with the complex fallout of what a lack of family identity will do, will do to them, both in their younger years and in their adult years. The evil actions spread in these passages from simply following one's own desires, they, 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 they go from simply following one's own, one's own desires to actively taking advantage of others. Psalm 14 talks of evildoers who eat up people as they would bread and who confound the plans of the poor. When we place ourselves of the throne, on the throne of life instead of God, the consequence is not only that we, we shove God aside in pursuit of our own desires, but often we end up shoving other people aside as well. And we become kind of numb to the needs of others. And if someone else's life and what they do is going to, is going to be adversely affected by my decision to live a better life, well, that's just the way it is, so be it. And as a result, people get crushed in the workplace by others who are climbing the corporate ladder. And as a result, people get crushed at school by, by those who bully others in an effort to improve their own status in the school community. The poor suffer and die because a, a small percentage of the world is so enamored with preserving their own lifestyle. And amidst all these ways that individuals that a society can go off track, Exodus tells us that humans seem determined to stay the course. The passage describes people who are quick to turn aside from the way God commanded them to live. And that once having turned aside, the phrase that Exodus uses is they become a stiff-necked people. I kind of like that image and that phrase. It, it, it goes beyond just being stubborn. They, they've turned aside from the life God has desired from them, for them. I mean, first they may have done it unintentionally and naively, but maybe later on more deliberately. But as they continue down that road, they increasingly refuse to see things in a different way from the way that they're living. They refuse to look to the, to the right, to the right, <laughs> and to the left, and, and they would never think of turning around. Their necks are stiff. They firmly, they firmly point their faces towards the path that they've set out for themselves. A path that in the short term fulfills all their desires and wishes, but in the long term, we'll see them take advantage of people. We'll see them do things that they, they never thought that they would do as the line between right and wrong gets erased. And it'll see them begin to lack even basic understanding and start to believe ideas and concepts that, that really make little sense when you really think about it. 
will see them think of themselves as wise in their own eyes when they've really become foolish. Their stiff-necked stubbornness has led them so far from what God created them to be, and as a result, they become objects of God's wrath and of his anger. But, and this is where the last three passages we read come in, the Gospel of John tells us that God did not send Christ in the, into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. No matter how far we have drifted away from center as individuals and as a society, there is always a way home. We've never drifted so far that God's arm cannot reach us, that God's ears cannot hear us. There is mercy and there is grace, but the key to receiving it is to loosen our stiff, stubborn necks and turn towards God again. Psalm 51 that Rob read for us demonstrates how to turn our stiff necks and also demonstrates the depth of God's mercy. Here's the context of Psalm 51. It was written by King David and it was written after he had slept with the wife of one of his generals while the general was off to war. And as a result, she became pregnant. And in order to cover things up, because people would be able to do the math, um, David had the general purposely killed in battle, and then he took that woman into his own house and became one of his wives. And not long afterward, David is confronted with his sin by a prophet. And in Psalm 51, we see David pouring out his heart before God in response. A friend asked me once, how come David was seen as a man who was after God's own heart and so close to God when he committed such terrible acts? I mean, even though the, the line between right and wrong is kind of blurry these days, if you were to lay that out before anybody in society, you know, a man had, had an affair with his, neighbor's, with his neighbor's wife and in order to cover it up, had his, neighbor, had his neighbor's, had the husband killed and then brought the wife into his own home and added so that he had many wives. Um, yeah, I think most people in society would go, that's not a nice man. <laughs> that's, that's a wrong and a very bad thing to do. So why is David seen as such a, a tower of faith and strength in scripture? I think the answer is David's response, which we see in Psalm 51. He wasn't like Saul or the others in the Old Testament who just made up excuses for their actions, blamed other people, oh, it's, it's their fault, it's their fault, tried to fix things their own way or, or simply ignored the word of God. No, David was immediately sorry. He was immediately repentant. And scripture tells us further along in Psalm 51 that God does not despise a broken heart. He does not despise a contrite heart, a heart that agrees with God that our actions have been wrong, have been sinful. A heart that admits that God is justified in his anger towards our sin. God does not despise a heart that is broken about how we have hurt God, hurt ourselves and hurt other people. A heart that desires to live differently. That's a heart that God can work with. It's a heart that God welcomes and that God loves. Psalm 51, 6 speaks of truth and wisdom. Change in our lives comes when we're willing to face the truth. That's not always easy. The truth of our own sinful condition. The truth about our stubbornness. The truth about our inability to determine right and wrong. Change comes when we, start believe, when we stop believing the lies that have become gradually a part of our very lives and we start accepting and living by the truth. This takes wisdom, which our previous passage says we lack. But David in this psalm prays a very important prayer. He says, teach me, Lord, teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Lord, come and give me the wisdom that I don't possess so that I can see truth more clearly and live the life that you've created me to live. So despite all of our stiff neckedness, all of our stubbornness, all of our doing things our own way, God delights in answering a prayer like that, Lord, give me wisdom. He wants nothing more than to have his children with him have live, and living the life he created them for. 
His love and grace and mercy is endless. And he will create a clean heart and put a right spirit in you. If you just turn to him with that humility, asking for forgiveness and taking steps to start doing things less and less your way and more and more God's way. The Apostle Paul is another example of the extent to which God will, will reach to bring his children home. And in the passage that Julie read for us, he describes himself, Paul describes himself as a blasphemer, which means someone who treated God with contempt and hatred, describes himself as a persecutor, one who, who acted violently towards people of faith, people who followed Christ. He describes himself as the worst of sinners. He didn't need other people to tell him that. He described himself. And yet, he declares that God's grace has been poured out on him abundantly through Christ. And he holds himself up as an example, saying basically that if God can show mercy and restore the life of someone like me, he says, if God could take me and forgive me and work through me to make a difference in this world, then he could do the same for anyone. No one is beyond God's reach. And that is because Jesus is, as one poet has said, the hound of heaven, constantly pursuing us when we've gone off track and lost our way. He is, as the gospel reading that Gina read for us, he, he is the good shepherd. In Luke, Jesus compares himself to a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And at the end of the day, he does a head count, you know, like the, like the sheepdog in Bugs Bunny, where he puts his hair up and counts the sheep. He does a head count and discovers that one's missing. Now to me, I'd be like, ah, oh, it's just one. I'll focus on the 99 who didn't wander off. After all, I gotta look after them. There's 99 of them. And besides, you know what? It's that own sheep's fault for wandering off. He didn't listen to my voice. I was calling them and he did, didn't come. So he didn't obey my instructions. Or Jesus could, could have said, you know what? It's dark, it's evening. I'll never find him in this darkness. I'll, I'll go up tomorrow after breakfast. I'll go out and look for him. And meanwhile, the wolves and the coyotes are moving in on the naive, defenseless, stubborn sheep. The scripture tells us that we are all like sheep who've gone astray. We have all, to one extent or another, we've stubbornly decided to do our own thing. We have all, or at one point or another, left home. Some of us didn't wander far before we realized that, hey, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm going. I better head back home. And for others of us, and even for people beyond these walls, the journey away from the shepherd has led to being and feeling completely and utterly lost with no idea of how to get back home. And increasingly losing a sense that there even is a home to go back to. Scripture tells us that for those who are lost, Jesus doesn't forget about them, figuring, oh, well, it's their fault for wandering off in the first place. And he doesn't put the search off until morning. He doesn't just sit with the 99 figure, oh, well, I've got my 99 sheep. That other one will come home eventually when, when they're ready. No, Scripture tells us that Jesus sets off into the wilderness to find us. And will not stop searching until he brings home what was lost. And the shepherd is relentless in his search. And when that sheep is found, the story gives no evidence of a scolding being given. You sheep, why did you wander off like that? No evidence of that. No evidence of punishment being meted out. Rather, the shepherd takes the sheep, puts it on a safe place around his shoulders. The sheep's weakness giving way to the shepherd's strength. And on those strong shoulders, the shepherd carries the sheep home rejoicing, rejoicing that the sheep has been found. In fact, he calls all his friends over, has a celebration that once was lost, what was once lost is now found. And so it is with Jesus, the good shepherd. He relentlessly searches for us, for our family members, for our friends. And when the one who is lost is found, the lost one exchanges their weakness for Christ's strength. And in that strength, the lost one is brought home. Not brought home to a scolding, not brought home to judgment or punishment, but brought home to a celebration 
that resounds throughout heaven. And Jesus says, this one was lost. This one acted like a fool and made some very poor decisions. This one lacked wisdom and understanding and couldn't even tell right from wrong anymore. This one had become skilled in doing evil and, and was less and less able to do good. This one took advantage of other people and was stubborn and stiff-necked. This one was very far from where I created her to be. But look, look, I found her. And, and instead of her stubbornly running away again, she let me pick her up and bring her home, back to where she belongs back to where I created her to be. She once was lost, but now she's found. Don't give up. Don't give up on society. Don't give up on your friends. Don't give up on your family. Jesus is always out looking for them in the wilderness, offering his grace, offering his mercy offering to bring them home. And don't give up on yourself. If you feel far from God today, stop running. Turn your stiff neck so that you can see the love on his face for you and let him carry you home. Would you pray with me, please? with our heads bowed and eyes closed, just so that we could focus. Maybe there are people that are crossing your mind as we prayed earlier tonight, today for people in our family who are far from God. Maybe there are people that you thought about, even as we were talking about that lost sheep, and you're thinking, yeah, that's, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my dad, that's my best friend. And Jesus is looking for them. And he wants to involve us, perhaps in talking to them, but definitely in praying for them. And maybe you just need to spend some time praying for those people that are on your mind. Or maybe you're here today and you're like, I kind of feel like that lost sheep. I kind of feel like I've done some stuff, maybe, maybe not as bad as David, but I've done some stuff that is really getting in the way of me connecting with God and really knowing God. Maybe you're here today, you're not even sure that God could be known. He can. Give him a chance. He wants to know you. He wants to show his love for you. Take a moment in this silence and talk to God. Whether it's about a friend or a family member that's lost, and you need to talk to God about that person, or maybe it's about yourself. And you just need that reassurance that God can be known and that he's real and that he forgives. Take a moment, just you and God, make this message personal in your life. Father, we lift up friends and family members for you, before you who are lost. They may not know it. They may realize it and not know which way to go. And Lord, it hurts so much to try to help them find their way and they get mad or they ignore us. Or, and it hurts so much just to stand and watch. Thank you, Lord, that in times when there's nothing else we can do, we can always pray. And even when there are things we, we can do, we can pray. And so, Lord, we lift up by name those people who are breaking our hearts as they are lost. And I pray, Lord God, that in the days and weeks to come, 
You would work in their hearts and minds. You'd bring situations into their lives that would help them realize how lost they are and how much you love them and want to bring them home. And I pray, Lord, that you could use us to help them find their way home. And Lord, as we examine ourselves, Lord, forgive us for the times that we've strayed, the times when we've done things our own way, the times when we've uh, ignored your proddings of your, the proddings of your spirit, Lord. Help us to understand that you don't prod us and push us and lead us into situations for just because you want it to happen. You, you do that for our own good because you want the best for us because you've created us for a purpose. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us daily to live in that purpose and to find that purpose. And for those that we encounter who are convinced there's no God and who are convinced that God cannot be known, even if he is, does exist, give us the wisdom, Lord, to be able to, one step at a time, bring them slowly to a place where they can meet you for real. Lord, thank you that you want to change us and make us more like you and help us, Lord, to cooperate with you in doing that every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.